All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where in the world you are. My name is Sunavi Brightham. I am the digital managing editor here at Free Speech TV. Today on Facebook Live with Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink. Thank you so much for joining us, Medea. Thank you, Sunavi, for having me on. It's great to be with Free Speech TV. Thank you. So let's jump right in. For folks who may not know about Code Pink, tell us a little bit about um, what you are, who you are, what you do. Well, first, let me go back to when we started, which was uh, right after the 9-11 attacks when the U.S. had just invaded Afghanistan and was getting ready to invade Iraq, which had nothing to do with 9-11. And we, like many, many people around the country, organized, mobilized. Uh, we took the name Code Pink because the Bush administration had this color-coded alert system. And it was yellow, it was kind of metal, mellow, orange, get scared, red, get really scared. And it was keeping people in a state of fear that would justify the invasion of not just Afghanistan, but Iraq as well. And we chose Code Pink. Originally, we wanted Code Hot Pink, but it was taken by a porn site. So uh, we were Code Pink to say there's another way to deal with the 9-11 attack, which is go after the individuals who attacked us and not use it as an excuse to attack um, entire countries. And uh, we did our job as citizens. In fact, we mobilized as a movement um, millions of people in the United States and many more millions of people around the world to say no to that war. Unfortunately, George Bush didn't listen, went ahead. And here we are, soon to be 16 years later, and uh, in the case of Afghanistan, over 17 years later, and look at the mess of the Middle East, the disasters of these wars. So we continue to oppose U.S. interventions overseas and to look at how we can move the money from our military budget into uh, things at home that are needed for improving people's lives and our planet and for helping people overseas as well instead of invading their countries. And certainly that, uh, certainly the invasion of, of Afghanistan, of Iraq, um, absolutely contributed to the current uh, state of things that we see in the Middle East. It was, of course, not the only thing in the Middle Western nations particularly have been intervening and mucking things up in the Middle East for kind of forever, yes? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I, I when there's all of this talk now about Russian interference in U.S. elections, I tell people, let's look at the history of U.S. interference in other elections. And why don't we look at Iran as an example where the U.S. actually overthrew a democratically elected government in 1953. And you can see over the decades, how that has affected the situation. It actually led to the reimposition of the Shah, uh, an incredibly repressive regime that led to people trying to overthrow the Shah, that led to the overthrow of the Shah, and the only place where people had to organize was really through the mosques, and that's why it became an Islamic revolution that was very anti-U.S. for good reason. And now, fast forward many years today, and you look at the U.S. talking about another uh, war in the Middle East in Iran, uh, I say, let's look at our history and learn from history for a change to see how our meddling in other countries has consequences that go on for decades and decades. And certainly, speaking of, of history and the uh, ways that we, we tend to repeat ourselves um, in, in history, um, you know, we're only 48 hours uh, through out of the election day 2018. Um, we did see some historic uh, moves there, uh, particularly when it comes to women. And I know Code Pink is a women-led organization. So I'm interested to get your take on uh, what the historic influx of, of women, particularly women of color, LGBTQ women. We have our first Muslim woman. We have our first uh, Native American women in Congress. Um, what are your hopes for kind of how that might shift the conversation at that uh, legislative and federal level? Well, we're very excited that more women are in Congress and that we have moved from uh, being one of the countries with the lowest number of women, at least to getting uh, close to 25 percent women. Uh, but of course, it should be over 50 percent to reflect the population as a whole. Uh, but it's, it, the issue is the quality of the women. And some of the women are just spectacular. Uh, we 
are excited that in the new Congress under democratic control, we'll have more of a chance to bring up a lot of these issues about militarism that have been swept under the rug for the last two years. Let me be clear, though, uh, the Democrats are not all that much better than Republicans when it comes to support for militarism. Uh, they just passed a uh, enormous military budget of over $700 billion uh, for 2019. That is even more than the Trump administration asked for. And there were very few members of Congress. In fact, it was only 10 in the Senate and uh, if, I think it was um, 54 in the House out of 435 who opposed that budget. And part of that is because so many of the members of Congress get money from the very weapons companies that benefit from the large Pentagon budget and frankly benefit from these wars. So we have a lot of work to do uh, with uh, the older members of Congress and the new members of Congress to highlight the, uh, the, uh, the stranglehold that militarism has on our political system and on our foreign policy and how bad this is for not only the countries that we invade, the places, the repressive regimes that we support, uh, the countries like Saudi Arabia that we sell weapons to to create the disasters in neighboring Yemen, but it's also robbing money from us at home that we need for so many other important things. And I hope that in this Congress, we can get um, some of these new, uh, very uh, progressive members to highlight uh, the importance of really um, talking about foreign policy in a new way, advocating for a different kind of foreign policy that supports diplomacy and nonviolent conflict resolution, and goes at the issue of the military budget, which has been one that uh, most politicians have not wanted to touch. Right, and certainly that, that question of the military budget and, and the massive scope of the U.S. military industrial complex does indeed seem to be one that, that most folks won't touch. It's a, it becomes very quickly, it devolves into a, a question of your patriotism and how much you love this country and don't you want us to be safe? So, you know, given that kind of historical weight and the, the shutting down of the conversation that tends to happen about that, you know, as an organization that's been around for a minute and has been having these conversations and, and organizing direct actions, what have you all at Code Pink found to be effective ways to move that needle and to, to break through into that conversation and make people start thinking critically about our priorities? Well, you're absolutely right. It's a conversation that unfortunately gets shut down too much. And we feel that now uh, is the time to push for uh, a conversation that talks about who is benefiting from all of these wars. Uh, I think a lot of people have suddenly uh, become aware of Saudi Arabia, for example, as a country that shouldn't be a close U.S. ally. It took the murder and dismemberment of a uh, Washington Post correspondent or a, a journalist uh, for people to open their eyes and recognize how bad this alliance is. And we hope that it will mean that they'll really see the disaster that the Saudis are causing in neighboring Yemen, uh, where millions of people are either uh, dying from hunger right now or about to die from hunger if we don't do something about it. And so we want to uh, highlight that issue. And then we also want to get down to the issue of you know, who really benefits from these wars? And there you have to talk about the weapons companies themselves, uh, what we call the war profiteers. And we have a, a, a pretty new campaign at Code Pink that we're very excited about called Divest from the War Machine, where we are asking our politicians to commit to not taking money from the weapons industry. So to be, if you look at every year how they vote on this massive Pentagon budget and how much of that budget goes right back into the pockets of the weapons industries who give our politicians money. Um, that sounds pretty corrupt to me. I don't know how you see that. And when we talk to our uh, members of Congress, we say to them, this is an absolute conflict of interest and we really need you to uh, commit to not taking money from those weapons companies. But this campaign goes way beyond that because just like the folks in the environmental movement have taken trillions of dollars out of the fossil fuel industry, we need to do the same thing around weapons. We need to get our, our pension funds, our cities, our, our universities, uh, our uh, places of worship to 
to commit to not being invested in the war machine. Cities, every city could pass a resolution and look at where the money is invested and make sure it's not invested in weapons. And this is something that crosses not just the folks who are concerned about militarism overseas, but about all the weapons that are flooding our communities here at home, whether it's the militarization of the police or the weapons that lead to these mass shootings that have become almost a weekly occurrence in the United States. So we can divest from weapons at home and abroad. And as you're talking about this conversation, I have a few points. One, I want to invite anyone who's watching on Facebook Live to please um, post your questions in the comments and um, we'll pass them along here to Medea. But also, as you're talking about this kind of in-depth, nuanced conversation that needs to happen and that really we're talking about looking at the structural uh, impact of, of the war machine of, and how deeply ingrained it is, um, Code Pink actually uh, moderated and hosted uh, exactly such a discussion uh, that will be airing on Free Speech TV on Sunday, um, uh, November 11th at 8 p.m. Um, on what some folks call Veterans Day. Uh, but Code Pink calls armist or recognizes as Armistice Day. So if you can tell me a little bit about um, why Code Pink makes that distinction between Veterans Day and Armistice Day. Well, first let me say we're really, really excited and grateful to Free Speech TV for having uh, worked with us on this town hall on militarism. And uh, we think that people are going to learn a lot when they tune into this and have this very in-depth discussion about such a critical issue. Uh, in terms of the Veterans Day, the first day that this program will air, we do call it Armistice Day, uh, which is what it was called from the time that it was uh, first declared in 1926 after World War I as a time to remember those who died, both uh, the, the soldiers as well as the civilians, and really a call for finding ways to live in peace, finding ways to end war. Unfortunately, as part of the buildup of this military industrial complex, it was changed in 1954 to be Veterans Day. And we find that today, uh, it is really part of the glorification of the military. It's not a time to reflect on how do we end wars. Uh, and uh, even uh, those who say that Veterans Day is to uh, thank the veterans, I think Veterans Day has become so much of a, a, a time to um, uh, uh, that has uh, things like uh, shopping for Veterans Day, sales on Veterans Day. Uh, people don't even use the time to reflect about war. So we think it's important to call it what it is, Armistice Day, and to recognize um, that uh, around the world, people are really hungering for uh, uh, us in the United States particularly to rebuild a strong anti-war movement. And what better time than on uh, November 11th to reflect on the horrors of World War I, the horrors of World War II, the horrors of war in general, and figure out how we as a nation can uh, be a part of this global effort to move towards uh, nations that learn to live in peace. And then one final question. I'm, I know that on the, the town hall that airs on Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, um, you do have, um, you have at least one veteran, um, a, a former Army Lieutenant Colonel, or Colonel, I believe, uh, who, who, who joins the conversation. And so I'm interested to, to hear kind of what you've heard from, if there are veterans who are members of Code Pink, um, we did a Facebook Live with um, uh, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard um, a few, uh, several months ago, and she actually spoke about um, how veterans are often some of the most outspoken activists for peace. And I wonder if you found the same thing in your organizing and if you have veterans who are members of Code Pink and are, are going to direct actions with you and what that looks like. Yes, yeah, certainly. In fact, on Sunday, we will be joining the uh, veterans who are doing a silent march in Washington, D.C. from the Veterans Memorial um, to call for exactly um, the country to reflect on how we can build peace. And we have veterans within Code Pink. We work very closely with groups like Veterans for Peace and some of the other veterans groups like the one called About, About Face that used to be Iraq Veterans Against the War. And we think the voices of veterans are so important uh, because uh, we need to uh, show that the call for living uh, in peace and focusing on diplomacy, not war, uh, is not something that is anti-veteran. In fact, it's pro-veteran. I just met a veteran the other day who told me 
about how she had to leave her family five different times to go on uh, tours in Afghanistan and in Iraq and how horrible it was for her, for her family, and how excited she was to learn about the movement and groups like Code Pink. So this is really for the, the people in the military uh, to work with them so that they can really defend us at home and not be used as pawns in a uh, foreign policy that keeps us in a state of perpetual war where the only ones who win from this are companies like the weapons manufacturers like Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin or Boeing or Raytheon, General Dynamics. These are names, these companies that people in the United States should know and that their image should not be one of these great citizens because let's face it, they use our tax money that they get from the Pentagon to tell us how good they are, but they should really be the way Pope Francis talks about them, seen as merchants of death. Well, I, I think that, uh, that, that that gives folks a lot of, a lot of uh, material to think about. Um, so we certainly uh, thank you so much for your time. We invite everyone to join us uh, for the Code Pink Town Hall and Militarism on Free Speech TV and Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Premieres on Sunday, November 11th, Armistice Day at 8 p.m. Eastern. And immediately following the conversation, um, the premiere, we'll be um, participating in a live Twitter chat um, with you, Medea, and Code Pink, and some of your partners um, using the hashtag DivestFromWar. Um, and that'll begin at 9 p.m. Eastern on Sunday. So we invite all of uh, our viewers and everyone tuning in today uh, to join us for that conversation and ask your questions about how you can get involved as well. Um, any closing thoughts, Medea, before we sign off here? Once again, to thank Free Speech TV and say how important it is that we uh, have these conversations and these town halls about militarism, uh, how we're excited about using Armistice Day as a time for people to really reflect, and how the new Congress is an opportunity for us to say time to stop the weapons sales to the Saudis, time to stop uh, giving $3 billion plus a year to uh, the Israeli military that it's using uh, to uh, uh, oppress the Palestinian people, time to stop giving so much of our military support to repressive government like the one of Egypt, uh, and really to look at how we can turn our foreign policy around. And lastly, to say, uh, we think that anybody who calls themselves a progressive in Congress must join us on seriously looking at how are we going to cut our military budget and free up hundreds of billions of dollars for things like health care and free college, the kind of things we really need in this country. So thank you so much for having me on, and thanks again to Free Speech TV. Thank you so much, Medea, and um, we'll see everyone on Sunday. Thanks for your time. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.